The title of the book is uh, A Lucky Child, and it goes back to, to something that happened in 1939 when my mother went with a friend to a fortune teller. And the fortune teller told her that things were going to be quite bad for us. But then she said, uh, you have a son, and the son will survive everything because he's a lucky child. When I asked about my experiences during the war, I would say I was lucky to get into Auschwitz. Then it's the truth. When you arrived in Auschwitz, usually what happened was that children, sick people, old people, would immediately be taken to the gas chamber. I managed to get into the camp rather than end up in the gas chamber. And that's what I always mean when I say I was lucky to get into Auschwitz. We were separated, my mother and all the women on one side, all men to the other. I only glimpsed my mother during that entire period in Auschwitz once for maybe less than five minutes. When we arrived, after we went through the, the usual disinfection and when they cut your hair, the next thing they did was to tattoo you. Of course, every morning when I wash and shave, there is my, there is my number. And in many ways, it, it's sort of a reminder of, of my own obligation uh, to, to work for a world in which this doesn't happen anymore, that uh, especially the children don't have to experience what I experience. I try to write the book the way I remember it, the experiences as a, as a child. Whenever I taught my sons how to ride a bike, I would reflect back on my own experience of learning how to ride a bike. I became an errand boy for the German commandant. One of my jobs was to take the bicycles of the uh, SS uh, visitors that he had and take them to a bike stand. I couldn't sort of resist the temptation to ride the bike itself. And of course, I would fall a few times. And, uh, and at the same time, I was terribly scared because if, if these people saw that I was riding their bikes there, I would have probably gotten quite a beating. But in the process, I learned how to ride a bike. So the, the experience of riding a bike was more unusual <laughs> than that of my children and many other children. I was liberated in the concentration camp of Sachsenhausen. I ended up eventually in a Jewish orphanage in Poland near, near Warsaw. At the same time, my mother in Germany and my uncle in the U.S. were looking for me. And then a miracle really happened because a person in the Jewish agency in Israel, or Palestine as it was then called, saw that there was a child on a list from coming from an orphanage that wanted to come to Palestine. And the woman in Germany looking for her child and then and he matched the names. It, it was really a miracle. We were reunited at the end of December 1946. When I'm asked how was it when I was reunited with my mother, I cannot talk about it. It was one of the most difficult parts to write about in the book because tears would always come. And so I, I would have to stop when I was writing that part, and that's why I can't even talk about it. I am the American judge on the International Court of Justice. It's a court that settles disputes uh, between countries. It's the highest international uh, court uh, in existence. My experiences uh, in, in the camps equipped me to be a better human rights lawyer. You, you, have a, you have a sense for what it means to be a victim, and you also have a sense of whether the people that you're interviewing, for example, are telling you the truth. When we talk about the Holocaust, the usual thing that you hear about is that six million died. Th that really doesn't mean anything to people. It doesn't mean anything to me. It loses the human quality behind it, the individual people who died. And so I've, I've always felt that it was important that we write about what happened to families, to individual people, uh, what they did during the war, what they did in the camps. And only th that way will we be ever able to understand the, the real human tragedy that the Holocaust was.